morning. Um, this morning, and in fact this month, as I'm sure you've picked up on, we're looking at, what are we looking at? Love, love that's right. Or as some of you, I think, just said love. <laughs> but we're looking at love. And uh, I want to make this simple point this morning, and if this is the only thing you remember, or if you're only going to remember one thing from everything that I say, make it this. Uh, you can write it down now and then, then go. Uh, loving God and loving others will mean that you become everything you could be and will lead you to the deepest and most profound joy and satisfaction that you could ever have. That's it. And to get there, I want to pick up on a point that Caroline made in her sermon last week. And she said this. She said, we love ourselves best when we love God most. Thank you very much. There's some love in action right there. <laughs> she said, we love ourselves best when we love God most. And there are three points that I want to make about this statement. The first is, that it's okay to want your best. And I'm going to explain why. And the second is that it's true that we love ourselves best when we love God most. And I'll explain why that is as well. And the third is you have to be so, so careful with this statement. And I'll explain why that is as well. So, number one, why it's okay to want your best. I think that sometimes for us as Christians, there's this sense that the main thing, the main thing that God wants from us is unselfishness. That's the primary thing that he wants from us, unselfishness. That God is happiest when we are least selfish. And there's an element of truth to that. But it's not true just like that. And C.S. Lewis comments on something very interesting and worrying that seems to have happened in Christian circles, which you've got on the slides. If you, asked, if you asked 20 good men today what they thought the highest of the virtues, 19 of them would reply, unselfishness. But if you had asked almost any of the great Christians of old, he would have replied, love. You see what's happened? A negative term has been substituted for a positive. And Lewis goes on to say that somehow the idea has got into our minds that going without good things ourselves is for some reason moral and pleasing to God. That God is pleased when we go without good things. The great Christians of old, on the other hand, would have been completely astonished by that idea. What a strange idea. The point about going without, they would have said, was so that other people could go with. In other words, the important thing isn't our abstinence. It's not, the important thing isn't that we abstain. The important thing is the other people's happiness. It's the provision for other people that's important. There's nothing virtuous about denying yourself things unless it's for the sake of someone else. You know, this idea that somehow God loves it when we just deny ourselves things just purely for the purpose of denying ourselves things and for no other reason is pagan. It's not biblical. Even fasting only makes sense, really, because it allows you and others to move forward spiritually. But if you just fast just for the sake of fasting, God isn't moved by it. Loads of people fast. But... You know, God isn't pleased just because you're denying yourself food. The question is, why are you doing that? What's the purpose of it? And so, self-denial isn't a great virtue in its own right. It has to be for a purpose, for a reason. And so, uh, we see in Matthew 16, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And Jesus tells the disciples to deny themselves, but for a reason. The reason is that they will find their lives if they do it. And the Gospels are littered with promises made to people who will deny themselves for the sake of Jesus Christ. 
says that they will see the kingdom of God, that they will enter the kingdom of God. They shall have everlasting life. They shall be with Christ. They shall reign with Christ. Christ shall not be ashamed to confess them before his Father to their salvation. They are promised glory, and the list goes on. And all this prompts Lewis to say, you know what, the problem isn't actually that we want too much, but that we want too little. He calls us half-hearted creatures, half-hearted creatures fooling about with sin and little desires when just over here, infinite joy is being offered to us. He says it's like a child who goes on making mud pies in a slum somewhere because he simply cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the seaside. It just doesn't mean anything to him. And if anything, then, he says, it's that we're far too easily pleased. God offers us the real deal, and time and again, we take the very bad forgery. There's nothing wrong with wanting the things that are promised to us in the Bible. It's fine to want those things for yourself. And we would scarcely have been promised them otherwise. Jesus would not have made promises if he thought that we shouldn't want those things. And somebody might say, however, but surely if you're just serving God in order to get his promises, there's something wrong with that. Surely we should be working for God and serving God, not for his promises. I'm going to explain a little while why that's wrong, or a misunderstanding in any event. I'll come back to that later. First, I want to look at why it is that we love ourselves best when we love God most. So, before we go any further, let's go over what I hope for many of you is familiar ground, and you find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is what love looks like. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. I want to look at an example of human love that I think is pretty easy for most of us to understand. Can I just ask Justice to come up, please? <coughs> this is my brother Justice. Say hello to Justice. Hello. hello. Justice is my brother in the strictly spiritual sense. He's also my friend. I think he's mine as well. So I think it's, it's a mutual friendship. What does that mean to say that Justice and I are friends? Well, it means that I will do things for his well-being, for his sake, for him. And he will do things for my sake <laughs> and my well-being, just so you know. And we both do that, and we both know that. We both know that we will do things for each other's sakes, for each other's well-being. And we do at least some things, not everything, together. So that we have joint activities, shared activities, shared community, and we share the enjoyment and the satisfaction that comes from those things. And friendship is an easy case of love, I think, easy to identify, because when you describe it like that, you don't even really need to have had a friend to realize, wait a minute, I'd be better off if I had that kind of relationship with someone. It's just obvious. It's self-evident. If, you know, if one of you wants to say, no, no, prove to me that friendship is good, I have no answer to you for you. It is just manifestly self-evident that that state of affairs where I am concerned for his well-being and he is concerned for mine and we coordinate our activities to reflect that and we both know that we are concerned for each, world's, each other's well-being is better 
than not having that kind of relationship at all. I would not be well off without any friends. It's obvious. It doesn't need defense. It's just obvious. It's self-evident. But the point is that I'm not well off just because justice can give me something that I want. Um, I don't know. Let's say he can help me with the church website, which, as it happens, he can. It's not because of that that I'm better off, because he can give me something that I want. It's that I'm better off just because we are friends. Just because of that. Just because knowing that he is my friend and I am his is in itself deeply satisfying. Now, Bala, where's Bala? Good morning, Bala. Bala said in Connect Group that if all I try to do is get what I can out of justice, and that is the full extent of our friendship, then it's no friendship at all, right? It's just a business relationship, or, or it's sometimes called a relationship of utility, where I use him and he perhaps uses me to get whatever we both need. I need website help, justice gives it. But if I value justice's well-being for his own sake, and he values my well-being for my sake, now we're talking about friendship. But it goes even further because in the strongest of friendships, I would value my well-being. I would value my well-being for his sake. And he would value his well-being for my sake. Why? Because if I know that part of my well-being is also part of his well-being, I want to be well off because I know that when I'm not well off, he's worse off. Do you see? And that, you know, that I imagine, you know, is, is what Justice and Jojo have. I trust. <laughs> but that is what the deepest the closest friendships look like. I love Pastor Shadrach and, and, and Auntie Violet. Good morning to you. Do you know what they say? They say they are each other's best friend. That is what they mean. They mean this stuff. They're talking about this stuff. <laughs> Apparently I'm still transmitting. There we go. What's the point of this? Slide, please. This is what John Finnis says. Self-love, the desire to participate fully in the basic aspects of human flourishing, requires that one go beyond self-love in the sense of self-interest, self-preference, the imperfect rationality of egoism. Put, on, put differently, let me explain this. I am better off, I am better off when I am looking to justice's well-being than when I'm just looking to mine. I am better off. I love myself better when I'm not just pursuing myself. This is a paradox. It's one that students encounter all the time. We talked about this in Connect Group briefly. Students who want good marks. So what do they do? They chase the good mark. The irony is that if they took an interest in the subject matter and actually did their best to actually understand it and to pursue it in an intellectual manner, to take an interest in the stuff itself, instead of just thinking, well, this is just a thing I have to use to get a good mark, they would get good marks. The key to getting good marks is to stop worrying about getting good marks. You love yourself best strangely, when you don't pursue yourself. I'm going to ask my friend to sit down now. <laughs> Thank you. But isn't that amazing? While the world is busy telling me that I have to pursue my own goals at any expense, 
You don't even need to be a Christian to work out that actually you're better off when you love someone else. It's a straightforward, self-evident truth. And you're not better off because they love you. As if there was a contract where you say, well, I'll love you as long as you love me, and so there's an exchange of love. No, because that would be a business relationship, a relationship of utility, and it wouldn't be love because love is about... Who is love about? The other person. Love is about the other person. No, it's just that you are better off, full stop, when you love someone and they love you. Not because there's a clever exchange going on, or whatever, but just because that state of affairs obtains. You're better off because you have a friendship. And actually, I'm pretty sure that I could have said none of that, because most of you already know that. Anybody who's got a friend knows they're better off for having a friend. And you don't even need to have a friend to be able to see, actually, that would be a good relationship to have. It would be better to have that kind of relationship. And so that we see that we love ourselves a great deal better when we love other people. We are better off when we have friends. Now, what if we were created to worship and love Jesus Christ? Mightn't it be the case that just as we are better off when we have a friend in a brother or sister we might be best off when we have a friend in Jesus Christ. I think that's the biblical position. I think that when we love Jesus Christ, we are set free from the law of sin and death. I think that when we love Jesus Christ, we are transformed through the renewing of our minds so that we don't conform to this world anymore. I think that when we love Jesus Christ, we lose the works of the sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, and that instead we see the work of the Spirit in our lives and the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think that when we love Jesus Christ, we get Jesus himself. We get him working in us and we get to love him more. We are assured of his love for us and we get to live in friendship with him because he calls us friends. We are saved and on earth, we get to be more than we would otherwise have been just because we are in fellowship with him. Just as we get to be more than we would otherwise have been if we have friendships. And later, we get to hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. And they will be the only words we want to hear on that day. We get to live in a relationship where we know that we have pleased the one whom we were created to please. Sometimes people think that's a negative thing. Oh, you shouldn't go about trying to please people. Perhaps not. But we don't always need to care about whether we're pleasing other fallen human beings. Not always. Sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. But what greater thing could there be for us than for him, the perfect father, to be pleased with us? Him taking pleasure in us. So, that phrase, we love ourselves best when we love God most, is true. It's obvious even in our human relationships but put it into a divine relationship, and it is manifestly true. Okay. Third, why we need to be careful with the phrase, we love ourselves best when we love God most. We need to be careful about that because it's easy to get hold of the wrong end of the stick and to start imagining that love is about looking like 
we love God. It's about turning up on a Sunday and waving holy hands and going, Amen, sister. Shalalalala. There's a 70s pop song that goes something like that. We might imagine that it's about looking like we're enjoying some kind of divine rapture. Oh God, you're so holy. But all the time inside, you're just thinking, oh, all I want to do is avoid hell and the disapproval of my peers and parents. <laughs> uh, Matthew 22. And one of the Pharisees, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so it turns out in the end that loving God is an all or nothing affair. We are to love God with all our hearts. Do you know, I don't know, I've read that verse for years and years and it completely passed me by, that that must mean with my emotions, with my feelings, my care, those kinds of things. And it turns out that we're also to love him with all our souls, with our intelligence, with our thought, with our action and with our spirits. And with all our strength, with every ounce of perseverance and endurance that we can muster. And then Jesus says this to the, the uh, Pharisees in Matthew 15. He says, you, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So the Pharisees had taken the law of God and they'd turned it into something else. And they claimed to honor God, but their hearts didn't belong to him at all. On the surface, they looked good. You know, passionate, keen to pursue righteousness and to honor and glorify God on the surface. But Jesus then says to them in Matthew 23, Woe to you! Scribes and Pharisees. Okay, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so it turns out that loving God means that every bit of ourselves has to belong to him. It means that even our desires and the emotions, the things that typically I think most of us think we have least control over, even those have to belong to him. I just don't feel that way, we cry. And still those feelings have to belong to him. We don't love ourselves best when we pretend to love God. We don't love ourselves when on the outside it looks like we're loving God. We love ourselves best when we look away from ourselves and towards God. And that means there has to be no pretense. You can't do that and fake it. It's not an option. And our love has to be the real thing. Uh, I gather John Mayer um, sang, although I'm sure other people sang before him actually, that love is a verb, a doing word, an action word. Sure. And, and the point about that, of course, that people make when they say that is, look, if all you're saying is you've got these feelings, but you're not actually going to demonstrate any kind of love at all, then what kind of love is that? And it's a fair question. I love you, I love you, then why do you keep mistreating me? The words are meaningless, right? Yeah.
But love isn't just a verb. It is also a verb, but not just a verb. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And just look at that. Envy. That sounds like a feeling to me. It may manifest itself in actions, but it starts inside. It's quite horrible, actually. Boasting and arrogance, they come with feelings. They come with feelings. Irritability, I know it well. It is a feeling that manifests itself in action. Resentfulness, feeling. Rejoicing comes with a feeling. Of course, these things have practical consequences. They have practical outworkings. When you rejoice, it's not normally just internal. It will somehow be displayed in how you behave. But love isn't just a verb. That's the point. Love has practical consequences, but that is not all that love is. It's not just what happens on the outside. It's what happens on the inside as well. John and Brech said, if John said to Brech, I love you, but by that he just meant, I'll buy you a house, and Brech might take the house. But I don't think she would fall for it. I don't think she'd say, yeah, that's love. No, no, no. She trusts John, partly because she knows that the buying of the house comes from what is inside. That's just a manifestation of what is within John. And now, perhaps, some of us, maybe for the first time, I don't know, maybe not, will see the measure of just how lost we are without Jesus Christ. How could we ever love him unless he first loves us and gives us his spirit and works a transformation in us so that not just our actions, but even our feelings are brought into line with his word. With what we know to be true and good and holy, but lack the natural strength to adhere to. You know my views on this. You know that I subscribe to the doctrine of total depravity. I believe that we are not born wanting Jesus Christ and that we cannot make ourselves want Jesus Christ. Don't believe that there's anything good in our natures. Believe all goodness comes from Jesus himself. is put within us. How could my emotions, the thing that I seem to have no control over, ever be conformed to that strict standard that I see in the Bible unless Jesus himself is willing to do the work in me? Because it's going to take a miracle. So here's the paradox. We love ourselves best and do the best we could ever do for ourselves and gain everything worth gaining when everything in us is aligned to love God. With, and here's the paradox, all the self-denial and not seeking ourselves and everything else that that entails. We can want our best and recognize that if we are to obtain our best, it will require us to give ourselves up. By way of example, it was in the prayer meeting on Friday, in the move. And it suddenly struck me that if I would worship God right there with sincerity, with all that I possibly could, not just out, outwardly, but inside as well. If I would glorify God instead of myself, I would be genuinely better off. Bizarre. Because you know what? My nature wants me to be worshipped. Not God. That's how I'm born. Wanting people to say, you are amazing, my friend. Go, yeah. 
That's right, I am. <laughs> That's what my nature wants all the time. It is the grace of God that allows me at some point then to go, no, I would be better off if I didn't pursue that. And instead of trying to get other people to worship me, I would worship God. And now I think we can come back to the question that I left us with earlier on. Is it right to want heaven, to want to be with Jesus, to want to reign with him, to want to be saved, to enter into his joy? Are these good reasons for denying ourselves? Are we allowed to serve God in order to have those things? Is that okay? Well, there are reasons that Scripture gives us, and that actually alone should be a good enough answer for us. But Lewis also gives us an answer. And he says, money is not the natural reward of love. And that's why we call a man mercenary if he marries a woman for the sake of her money. You know what a mercenary is? Somebody fights for pay, not for loyalty. So you can just buy their loyalty. But you've got to be careful because at any time somebody else might come along and give them more money. Okay. But marriage is the proper reward for a real lover, and he is not a mercenary for desiring it. A general who fights well in order to get a peerage to get into the House of Lords is mercenary. A general who fights for victory is not. Victory being the proper reward of battle, as marriage is the proper reward of love. The proper rewards are not simply tacked onto the activity for which they're given, but are the activity itself in consummation. Wanting a reward is not always a bad thing. Sometimes, because the reward might just be the proper thing to want. Wanting to be with Jesus Christ in eternity is not a bad thing. You don't need to beat yourself up if that is what you want. It's okay to have that want. To want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. To want to be saved, to want to have the Father declare his pleasure in you. To want to enter into his joy. All those things... Those are the fulfillment of earthly discipleship. That is where earthly discipleship leads to. That is the natural conclusion of earthly discipleship. Discipleship, when it is complete and fulfilled, leads to all of that stuff. It's fine to want those things. We should want them. It's okay to want to enjoy God. And to want to get as much out of your relationship with him as you possibly can. And to want him and to want your prayer life to be fulfilling and your Bible reading to be alive to you. It's okay to want those things. Those are proper wants. And I think many of us, frankly, will avoid going to prayer meetings and praying and whatnot because we think, I don't really want it, but apparently I still have to do it. I don't really want to do this thing because it's dull, but apparently I still have to put up with the dullness and just be dull and just enjoy dullness. No, no, not at all. That's not what Jesus Christ calls you to. He doesn't call you to enjoy dullness. He doesn't call you to enjoy communion with him. So if you're thinking, oh, well, these prayer meetings are not really for me because I find them kind of dull. It's okay in principle, that you find them dull. Because the point is, you're on a journey. And the question is this, do you actually believe that Jesus Christ is going to get you to the goal of total transformation where even your feelings are in line with what he wants? And where even prayer, even prayer, and this may sound like a miracle to some of you, is a beautiful thing to you? Do you believe that? Do you trust him to get you to that point? God transforms our hearts. He promises a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. A heart that feels the way it should feel about the things it should feel in a certain way about. And so Jesus says in John 7, well it says rather in John 7, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of his heart, not just his mind or whatever, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given. 
because Jesus was not yet glorified. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. But do you believe that? Do you really believe that Jesus can do that in you? That Jesus can bring your thoughts and your emotions into line? Or do you believe it's just a hopeless case? What I want to suggest to you is this, that sometimes you have to obey. You simply have to obey. Because there's not much else in you except that. But that as Lewis says with time, and I think many will confirm this, obedience gives way to longing. And the law of the Lord and doing his will becomes our delight. Our delight. Do you trust Jesus to do that work in you? So my encouragement to you this morning is this. Find out what God promises you. Find it out. Read his word and find his promises so that you know what they are and then put your faith in him concerning them. That if you will do as he says, he will give you all that he promises, including the transformed heart and mind. Don't be satisfied with the little pleasures of sin. I know how easy it is to be satisfied with those things. I know that at the time they can seem like the best thing on earth. Maybe in a manner of speaking, of course, they are the best thing on earth. On earth. The best kind of thing that earth has to offer. The best thing that a fallen world has to offer. Don't be satisfied with those things. Because they lead to death. And sometimes you can't see how they lead to death and it takes other people who've actually experienced them properly to say, no, it killed me inside. Bit by bit I saw myself. And if it weren't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Dare to imagine, just try to imagine that what he's offering you is much better than anything anyone else has ever offered you. In fact, so much better that you can't really comprehend it because you haven't experienced it. And dare to believe that this process starts on earth as we walk with him and put our faith in him and our trust in him and as he transforms us. And dare to believe that all of this leads to a completed race, to a crown of victory and eternity knowing his pleasure in us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your promises towards us. I thank you, Lord, that we find our greatest fulfillment in you. That all joy and delight is found in you. That when we turn our eyes upon you, the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. And we discover bit by bit that you are so much better than anything on this earth. That you are so much better than all our sin. That you are so much better than all selfishness and unrighteousness. That being with you is the best thing that could ever happen to us. And I pray, Lord, that you will give each one of us that revelation and that experience. That you will give us the endurance to pursue you to pursue you in prayer, to read your word, to obey you in our daily walk, even when we don't really understand what it will lead to. Lord, grant us the faith to trust you that even in those situations where we don't really know what we're doing, only knowing that we must obey, that you will bring it to the best that it could be. And I pray you complete that process in us, that you take us all the way. Until you are our greatest joy and our greatest delight and the fulfillment of all our heart's desires, the fulfillment of all our needs and our wants. Until we discover the truth that you really do transform us. 
and make us into your image. Lord, we bless you and we praise you for the gift of the Holy Spirit in us, doing your work and bearing fruit. And I pray, Lord, that you will give us the discipline and the endurance to be obedient, to pursue you, and the faith to believe what you promise us. In Jesus' name, amen.